Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and kindness, for faith and for faithfulness. We pray that you would bless us today as we encounter your holy word and seek your guidance for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. A recent survey indicated that 66% of American men and 50% of American women have been unfaithful to their spouses. Now those are, those are statistics that are secular statistics, but we learn from a lot of statistics that the church is no different. In fact, C.M. Ward, who used to be a speaker on Revival Time radio program, said that if there were 100 people in a congregation, the chances are that someone in that congregation is sleeping with someone else's spouse. That makes me uncomfortable. I hope it does you too. I mean, that's, that's really some sobering, chilling statistics. But this isn't a message of, um, of doom and gloom. I really hope that it becomes a message of hope and encouragement for you. I've decided to use a few pictures of my kids um, in my sermon today, this is my oldest daughter Kyle and her husband, my oldest daughter Lydia and her husband Kyle uh, when they were married a few years ago. Um, sometimes people ask me, um, what is your definition of success? And over the last few years, I've, I've given the same answer. Uh, what is your definition of success? What makes you successful? And the answer I give 100% of the time nowadays is faithfulness. Think about that. If you are faithful to death, you will receive the crown of life. What's, what's more successful than that? But faithfulness is my answer every time. What's success? You see, marriage requires faith and faithfulness. It's, it's utterly needed for a good and solid marriage. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but you know the Bible has some specific words which we translate with the word faith. It has the concept of being persuaded, being persuaded, fully persuaded to the point of belief, to the point of trust, to the point of confidence, to the point of hope. Faith is being persuaded, okay? Utterly persuaded. That kid can jump because he's convinced he's gonna be caught, right? Faithfulness is staying persuaded. As in, nothing is going to shake my faith in God. No one is going to shake me from knowing God and knowing what he says is utterly true. Staying persuaded, being persuaded. This is my daughter Hannah and her husband Andrew. God's design for marriage persuades couples to leave their parents. Think about that, living in a home, having your food and having your shelter, having the support of your family, but, but God's design for marriage actually persuades a couple to leave that. Genesis chapter two, leave your father and mother persuades people, couples to cleave to each other. The idea of, of being stuck to someone in a bond that is so strong. God's design for marriage persuades couples to weave their lives into oneness. my son Elijah and his lovely wife April they were at my house last night 
our connection to God, our relationship with God is a connection made by faith. I have faith in God and so I am his and he is mine. Faith is highly relational. I have faith in God. I know he loves me. I know he won't let me down. I have faith and confidence that he forgives because he says so. It's a real relational thing to have faith in God and to have faith in one another. Oh, I forgot to point out that's my granddaughter in the corner. I just kind of scooched the picture over so you could see her too. (laughs) Faith makes certain relationships holy. We use the word holy in the church to describe something that's set apart. We are holy people. We're, We're different, and it's okay to be different from the world. It's okay to have a relationship that's very different from common relationships in the world. What kind of relationships are holy relationships? My my relationship with God is holy. It's a connection made with God by faith. And it means that my connection with God is something I would die for. When I was confirmed on March 19th, 1978, Pastor Freeze asked us trembling kids, would you forsake all, even death, rather than fall away? And I remember shaking and grabbing the pew in front of me and said, yes, with the help of God. Seriously, a holy relationship is utterly important. Would I die for my connection with God? Would I give myself, would I give up on other things for the sake of the one I have married? So faith makes certain relationships holy. And that's why we recognize them in church. See, these relationships must not be broken because they bear witness to God. Throughout the Bible, the marriage relationship is one that gives us an example of how God loves us and how we love, honor, and respect God. It's eternal. These relationships must not be broken because they are to give an example of an eternal relationship. And so with the best that we have with our entire lives, we are to remain committed and strong and faithful as we bear witness to God. At the heart of relationship failure is broken faith. It's described this way in the Bible um, in Joshua chapter 22, verse 16. The whole assembly of the Lord says, how could you break faith with the God of Israel like this? How could you turn away from the Lord and build yourselves an altar in rebellion against him now? See that breaking the relationship with God was breaking faith with God. And in Malachi 2, 13 to 16, It says, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth because you have broken faith with her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant, Has not the Lord made them one in flesh and spirit? They are his. And and why one? Because he was seeking godly offspring. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. Faith.
The word in Hebrew is na'af, adultery. And this word has with it, in its root understanding, the importance of faith. Breaking faith is adultery. The similar word in Greek, moikeia, is adultery. It means breaking faith. And literally, if you want to define it, it's when there is an inappropriate sexual relationship between married people, a married man or a married woman, and it brings great dishonor to a holy God. Scripture says do not break faith with your wife. And it's such an important picture of our relationship with God He takes it very seriously. In fact, this is where we get the gospel lesson where where a woman was caught in the very act of adultery and dragged into the center of a group where Jesus stood. Teacher, we caught this woman. What do we do? The law says to stone her. The point of The gospel lesson there is not the act. Not the act. It's so simple for us who haven't done the act, who haven't been caught in the act. It's so simple for us to stand around and say, yeah, look what that person did. But this sin begins with a persuasion in the mind. A persuasion in the mind. Faith is persuasion and staying persuaded. But a persuasion in the mind can cause us to break faith. Do you remember cupidity from a few weeks ago? Cupidity? It's a lust for something that you don't have. We talked about it when we talked about coveting your neighbor's spouse or your neighbor's belongings. Wanting something that you don't have. Today I'd like to think about it as stupid Cupid. We've all got our stupid Cupids. And the sin of adultery certainly is an act but it begins in the mind. When it comes to our sexuality, men and women are different. I don't know if you've ever seen this control panel, but the top half is the man's control, and the bottom half is the woman's control. We kind of think differently about sexuality, but really, men and women alike have stupid cupids. Stupid cupids that persuade us differently, that persuade us to break faith in the most important holy relationships. There's another word in the Bible that speaks of sexual immorality. It's the word porneia. Porneia. A lot of Greek words sound like English words. Actually, a lot of English words came from Greek words, to tell you the truth. At the root understanding of porneia is the idea of selling out, trading off. It's the root word for adulteress or prostitute, porneia. And this word in Greek and in the New Testament can stand for a range of sexually inappropriate things. But here's what porneia is. Porn is a sellout to a fantasy. That's also a biblical Greek word, fantasia. It appears in the book of Acts. It means a show. Okay, it's not even real. Fantasia is fake. 
And men and women react to our stupid cupids simply by the way we're wired by the way we fall into sin. See, men are persuaded by beauty. You know, the heads turn. Men are persuaded to give a second glance, a third glance. It's a stupid Cupid. Women are persuaded by strength. Now this beauty and strength aren't just about appearance. It's not just about muscles. But the stupid cupids, the pornea in our lives draws us away from a faithful relationship. We get the word pornography. Pornographe, it's pictures sell out to a fantasy of a beautiful woman. Not even real. But it's not just the physical appearance. Not a fantasy of looks, but a fantasy of looks and behavior that men like. It's dangerous there will always be a prettier girl to persuade even a faithful man to break faith. We, um, we have a word, a porno word, and we shake our finger at the pictures and the images But there's another word, it doesn't exist, but I've used it before, pornomance. Uh, You can't see these pictures too well, but I I just did a Google search of romance novel book covers. There is hardly a shirt on any of those guys on those covers. It's the truth. All those covers show shirtless guys because they're strong. Poor nomads, the the lust for romance is not just about muscles, it's about fantasy strength that women like. Strength like, oh, he's so sweet. He's such a good dad. Look how attentive he is to his wife. Oh, he's hard working, handy, helpful, heroic. There will always be a stronger man to persuade even a faithful wife to break faith. You see, we have our stupid cupids. Persuasive. And we sell out too often to that which is not real. That's what Jesus was getting at when they stood around with the stones. Okay, this woman was caught in the act. Now those of you who have no stupid cupids, start throwing How do you deal with faithfulness in marriage? How do you deal with sexual purity and fight against impurity? I said it in the first message in this series and I'll say it every time. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Where we fall because we're sold out to some kind of a show, a fantasy, something that's not even real, something that we lust for that doesn't belong to us. We seek after beauty, we seek after strength. 
Jesus is both real beauty and strength. Think about that. We sing the song, Beautiful Savior. It's because, well, even the Bible says he doesn't have any stately form or majesty that we should desire him, nothing in his appearance that we should seek after him. But he's gentle, he's humble, he's loving, he's sacrificial, he's strong, he's heroic. So it's only Jesus who can help us to be beautiful and to be strong. But it's important, it's important, ladies, to understand this. In a world where there will always be a prettier girl, it's important to realize that women are not made to pursue beauty, but to release it. You can put everything in the world on your face. You can have every kind of surgery you want to try to be more beautiful. But we're not to pursue that. We're to release beauty. Beauty that is real like the beauty of Jesus that is real beauty. Compassion, kindness, faithfulness, trust. You know where this is going, guys. You can pump all the iron you want. You can run marathons, be triathletes, Iron Man, whatever. Men are not made to achieve strength, but to release it. Not long ago, I I was visiting with a couple that was having marital problems. And I realized that... um, They were looking at the stupid cupids. I asked them to say what they liked about each other. And he talked about how beautiful she is and the real beauty that he saw in her and still sees in her. And she literally said these words, he's the strongest man I know. Guys, this guy could not pump much iron. I, trust me, I could probably do more than him. That doesn't matter. That's not what strength is. God has made us to release beauty. God has made us to release strength. And it's because of his beauty and strength that we've got it to give The beautiful Jesus took the ugliness of our sin and he was nailed to the cross where his strength drained away. So that he could make us beautiful and strong. Faith in, gro- faith in God grounds us for faith in each other. You see, faith is the gift at the center of a strong and beautiful relationship. How do we keep these commandments? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Can I just say, this isn't in my notes, 
women, you're beautiful in Jesus. You're more beautiful than any fantasy could ever be. You're beautiful. Release it. Men, you are stronger than Charles Atlas. Whoever he is, no, I know. You're stronger than the guy in the gym. Release it, men. I've agonized over this sermon. And I asked for special prayers this past week for this sermon. After I preached it in the first service, I broke down. And um, an elder gave me a great big hug, and I just wept. The reason I asked for prayers with this sermon is because I, I didn't do the act. I didn't get caught in the act, but I stood there with my stones, just like you have. And in standing there with the stones, I've been absolutely unwilling to see my own brokenness, my own stupid cupids. So God wants us to drop the stones. Have faith and be faithful for Jesus' sake. Gracious God, we ask that you would fill us with your strength and your beauty. Teach us to be faithful in our relationships with our spouses. Teach us to be faithful even more in our relationship with you and so never to turn aside to the stupid cupids, to seeking after being persuaded by selling out to some sort of fantasy that draws us away from what you have joined together. And help us to love and honor you. In your son's name, amen.